Today, John Schuster is an author and educator who speaks to a wide range of audiences. He's an expert in adult development for both early career and mid-career, and more recently for those in later life stages. He is an often requested resource as a coach and a teacher singer for a wide variety of individuals and audiences in various stages in the aging process. His books cover topics such as purpose and vitality and life review. His podcast with Public Radio on Aging Consciously is carried by NPR and is titled Stories for the Ages. Please join me in welcoming John Schuster. His presentation is titled Aging with Intention and will focus on the opportunities and challenges of the aging process. John? Thank you so much, Terry. And after that kind of of uh, introduction. I, even I want to hear what I'm going to say. <laughs> this guy might be good. Who knows? So uh, it's really my pleasure and honor uh, to be here today. I mean that. Thanks for showing up in such, it's such uh, nice numbers here. And that means maybe the topic is really worth going after, especially because our society is not so good at teaching about the positive ways of looking at aging. And so this has a bias towards positivity. I'm going to definitely put it's, a, it's not a half-empty day, it's a half-full day, all right? And just know that we can talk about the downsides of aging, and, and, and we could do that today, but not in an hour. We don't have enough time to do something more lengthy, right? We'll just talk about that a little bit. It's, it's, so the point is to be realistic, but realistically positive about what this age uh, if affords us as an opportunity. So that's by way of introduction. Um, my research on this is mainly reading. I've read gerontologists and I've read geriatric people and it's out there. It's, a lot of that's kind of dry though, but the, uh, the books I put on that book list, for those of you who took it, tend to not be dry. They, I tried to put it at the beginning, at the top. They have, a, they have a tilt towards spirituality and psychology, which is a lot of the things I've had interest in, but, uh, it, but not all of them. Some of them are pretty, pretty factual. And, and, and if there was one I'd read on there, if it's, it's for starter, it's the one by Joan Chittister. I think it's called The Grace in Aging. Somebody knows that there's a smile back there. And it's, it's probably the easiest, most uh, positive read out of all of those. But I'd say all of them are worthwhile. So uh, take that for, for if you'd like to take, uh, take a, something away from this. Um, my research really is talking to older folks and getting older myself. I'm 75. So I started this when I was in my late 60s, and that was, I didn't really qualify until I turned 70. I felt good to turn 70. I said, no, now I can talk about aging better. But, um, and there's, uh, well, let's do a little show of hands here, if you don't mind. Uh, who, is there any, there's some 60-somethings in the room, any 60-somethings? All right, all right, let's, let's hear it for the 60 some because that's the, that's, the, that's the group that's called the, the younger old folks, the younger old folks. <laughs> And, uh, and then who's the, who's the uh, 70? Let's see, the 70-something. All right, a lot of 70-something. All right. 80-something. Let's see the 80s. All right, some 80-somethings. All right, 80-somethings. All right. So it's, 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 it's called the, the young old are called uh, uh, go-go. They're the go-go. Then there's the, uh, the, the mid-age. That's the slow-go. <laughs> and then the, the 85 and above is the no-go. They're the no-go. <laughs> and... Uh, but, that, but, but think of that as, as, a, as a quick little label for like, like how, pe how people take travel. So a lot of people want to travel, 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 and they do a lot of that. I know, I, I know a lot of did that when I was young. And now it starts to slow down and you start to you know, shift your view of, of your mobility and what that's all about. And so so th that phrase is not just meant for, you know, for humor. And there, I know plenty of 80-somethings 80, 80 who are defying the, 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 the no-go, but they're still active as heck and running around and doing stuff. And I know plenty of 60s who want to, who want to do slow-go. And um, so there's, there's all kinds of ways to approach this, and uh, I've tried to give you a couple things to, to get started with. So, so here's our, our, our summary comment. I think in the old military model of training, remember, it was tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them and then tell them what you told them, right? So, so that's how we'll summarize. But this would be the summary that, are, are you going to get old or are you going to grow old? And what that means is the growing process is a developmental process. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna use that positive half-full frame to look at what are the possibilities for continuing our growth 
uh, and, and here's the four, I'm going to give you four things. The ones that are in red are the ones that you can say, okay, that's what we're going to talk about. Humor and fun as an asset. So we're going to talk about there's a lightness of being that really helps in this aging process instead of getting grumpy and grouchy and saying, oh, it's all going, I'm all going down, it's all downhill. Remember when you got black balloons at the office when you turned 40? Well, <laughs> What was that about? If you turned 40, if you, if you turned 40 today, you'd celebrate, say, man, this is great. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, there's, there's such a negative frame on aging that our culture continues to put out there. And, and some of it is in, in good fun, but some of it is pretty negative after a while. And then relationship as a source of connection and love. You don't need to say much about that, but it really is huge. And with the isolation problem gets, gets significant for, for elder people. Um, and uh, so that becomes important. Learning as a source of vitality. So how are you learning? And what are you learning? There's so many. The, why do you watch the History Channel so much now? Saying, oh, I love the History Channel. It's, a great channel. it's because you've had time now to learn about the human story. Saying, this is great. I'm expanding my sense of, of uh, what it means to be a person today. It's great to know where you are today and where you're going forward by, by understanding where we have been as a, as, a, as a species. Spirituality and a spiritual life as a guide. I, I'm not going to make this a... A, a, a faith-centric presentation by any means, but it's very faith-central, faith-friendly. Uh, faith it's a faith-friendly presentation because there's just good research on the notion of, of however you want to go about your spirituality, and we'll give you a few of those options later in terms of talking about it. But that's a big part of, of what we'll talk about. So those are the four big thoughts that you'll, you'll see those weaving in and out. And I won't do justice to any of them, but hopefully get touch enough on all of them to come together and, and make some sense for you. So those are the four things that help us lean into what the introduction said, the joys and the burdens. There's definitely burdens at this time, but that's what can help us. Those are our resources. All right, so uh, it's a mindset thing. See the word mindset down there? Ooh, I can't tell you how important the, the sense of having uh, a positive frame is. And it's not just, like I said, um, silly positive. Every day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. You know, that, <laughs> you, that's just, that's, that's too light. You know, that's not what it's about. It's deeper than that. But, but uh, it is mindset, is, and everybody has their own mindset and their own unique gifts of how you put your life together. You've gotten this far, and congratulations. Here you are in this room to talk about this. So there's something to be tri triumphant just about that. And there is no single path. There is... If there's 200, 200 of us in the room today, there's 200 ways of, of going about this. And that's because all of our paths are so unique. I'll give you some patterns. We know some patterns and themes. But then your individual way of working through that is really where your unique story and your unique way of going about this. So everybody should be writing their own book on aging, really, and, and, and saying, this is the way I, I'm doing it, and I want to do it, and continue to do better. So keep that in mind. If I ever get on a high horse here and start saying, this is the way it should be, I'm just trying to compare notes. You know, I'm, I'm sharing my notes with you. If we were sitting down across from each other at a coffee shop like Brad and I do or Phil and I do, or you know, you know, and we do that, we just kind of compare notes. We're just b bouncing ideas off of each other. But there are some good thinkers here that if you, if you read about this, you start to get encouraged if you, read the right, if you read the right literature. So it's a big reframe. By reframe, what do I mean by that? It's just a way of it's half empty, half full. So what's the negative frame that we all get? The negative frame that we get is decline. It's a time of decline and watch out, here we go, and you know, over the hill and all those terrible things. Um, and, and, uh, and when we want to use a positive frame and lean into aging and saying, I'm, I'm age full, I'm not a, you know, I, I like being my age. Uh, we, you know, so, yeah, the number one compliment you can get when you're getting older is when you say, how old are you? I'm 75. Oh, you only look about 65. What's wrong, with, what's wrong with being 75? I don't mind being 70. And so, but it's an automatic compliment because they think, and they, you know, people mean, well, I say that to people sometimes. But you know what that's really saying is, oh, too bad you're getting so old. <laughs> instead, of, instead of, I, had a, I was given a speech at a nursing home because I'll take my guitar out and sing at uh, assisted living places and stuff like that. One woman sat down in front of me. How old are you? I'm 101. And she was so proud to be 101. It was so great to hear her talk. She started telling me stories about being 101. But you could tell she had, she, uh, as, as people that age say, well, there's not very much peer pressure at this age. So, <laughs> so, so, uh, 
and, and so, so, but this is the story that has to be changed by those, that, and we're doing it in this room by living, we're already doing it differently. And so the gerontologists in some ways are behind and trying to catch up with what's going on. Just like retirement. We'd watch the, uh, the stories on retirement, the, the advertisements on retirement 20 years ago. Remember those? This is not your father's retirement. This is not your parents' retirement. We knew something was changing 20 years ago in retirement, but we didn't know what exactly. Now there's actually data out on retirement saying, oh, wow, look at how much this has changed. Here's the way people go about it. And it's much more active than it used to be. For, for a couple of reasons, longevity is one of them. We're just living so much longer, but also vitality. When you have longevity and more vitality, it opens up the world. And so we know that retirement has changed a huge amount uh, in the past 20 years by looking at it. And that's, that's why this story, though, is still prim primarily the ones that we've picked up, and hopefully we don't pass it on to our kids. So this is the, this is the story you're getting today on development. Uh, we go from discretionary time that is purposeful and life-giving when we choose wisely instead of just watching the TV and getting ticked off at the political party that doesn't represent you, right? Because that's what the media wants us to do is get grumpy and mad and angry and think we're going to all die because the other people are all coming after us. And, you know, don't buy into those extreme things because it's not healthy for us to, to, get, uh, to let other people make us angry. So what do, what do we do with this wonderful gift of discretionary time is part of the choices that we have to make. All right. So um, I've got PowerPoints I'm going to get through here. I'm going to have my wife. Oh, you should meet my wife, by the way. This is Patricia Kane in the back. She was, my, she was helping out back there earlier. Hi, Patricia. And we've been married. Uh, we're in our 38th year. And, uh, and uh, she's, she's my aging partner with me. I see some of you came with your partner today. That's wonderful. You, some of you may have already lost your partner and are into your a new stage of life. That happens a lot in the widow, widowhood, widowhood thing. Um, but um, uh, my discretionary time partner is Patricia, and we've been having a great time. The reason I'm in Parker, I've been here less than four years, is because her family is out here. So I'm the trailing spouse. And it's fun to, to be out here and be explore. How could I not enjoy being in Colorado? We came from Ohio. And that's how long I've been here. And everybody has their own version of what's happening in your aging process and where, how you've chosen to use your discretionary time. I'm going to give you a couple of reframes right now from uh, uh, this to get into the, some, of the, some of what's in the books here. I think this book is on your list. If it's not, it should be. Look, look on that book list. Is, is this book on the list? Is that just a great title? Can you just read this title? What are, what are old people for? Is that a great title? <laughs> it's a great title. And I'm going to give you a phrase from him. It talks about, as you know, when you get older, you start to walk differently. And, and you can even start to shuffle and go slow. And, uh, with, and I, I remember when I used to look at a, at a, when I was like 60, I'd look at an older person, and they'd be going, shuffling along there and say, oh, the poor guy, can hardly move. Well, listen to this doctor. This is that the, the, the geriatric guy that wrote the book, <clears throat> um, What Are Old People For? He says, listen, and, and listen, I'm going to read a paragraph here, so it's a little long, but it's worth getting his view of what it means to be getting older. Compared with the fluid stride of youth, uh, the, the, the marks made by the older person can seem te tentative and ungainly. This appearance is deceiving. The reality is that older people execute a highly evolved, richly detailed strategy that maintains upright ambulation into the last decades of life. Old people alter their gait in special, uh, in special ways in, in, of coordination, sensation, and reaction time. The shuffling gait keeps the feet close to the ground and maximizes input from position sensors. The stance is widened to improve balance. The number of steps taken per minute is decreased to accommodate changes in endurance and to allow for increased re reaction time. Keeping a human body upright and moving is a spectacular feat of coordination and reaction under any circumstances. Doing so in the ninth decade of life magnifies rather than diminishes the beauty of this achievement. Is that a beautiful paragraph? The whole book is about that. The whole book saying, we are so missing what's going on when we compare uh, older folks to younger standards and midlife standards. What's that about? Why don't we have our right? So don't take the yardstick you used from earlier in life and bring it to this time of your life. It's the wrong yardstick. No wonder we have a negative frame. 
we're measuring ourselves against the wrong crap. Excuse me for saying that. <laughs> I knew I'd get colorful today. Remember, the, I don't represent the Pace Center. That they would, they would never say crap here. So, okay, so. So that's the one on aging bodies. Here's the one on time. I like this one on time. This also is a book. This is a book, the only book that's out of print on your list is uh, called uh, The Joy of Old. But this, I had a great mentor. I was 39 years old when I first heard the phrase uh, second half of life. I remember thinking, well, what's that? What's the second half? You know, you're 39, you're clueless about, you know, you just think people get old. But there was some, uh, I had a mentor who talked about the second half of life. He wrote this beautiful thing on time. The joy, of, the joy of old. To successful elders, time is a precious gift. Uh, what was commonplace in earlier years, a walk in the garden, a sunset, a talk with a friend, is imbued with wonder and magic. We want to fill our days with appreciation of the commonplace as wonderful. Elder time is on loan. We see it as more life, more opportunity, more daily adventure, more beauty, more human connection. I have only today, says the woman in her 80s, I may be gone tomorrow. There is a paradox in elders' view of time. Time is running out, yet there's no rush. Wrapped in the essence of life and pursuing only values of highest priority, elders proceed with a sense of leisure. The midlifer is the begrudging engineer of passing time. The elder is a generous user of borrowed time. The midlifer faces deadlines and turns to work. The elder faces death and turns to life. Right? Another great frame. So that's part of the reframing thing is, where, where, where have these people been? Why, why, you know, why do they have to be obscurely, you know, uh, 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 so, so, so hard to find? And they are hard to find because you won't find them on, in the main media except you'll see, you know, what we get instead is 92-year-old <clears throat> guys who can still water ski. And you're supposed to think, oh, that's it. That's it. I want to be 92. That's, that's you know what they, you know what the, uh, I've heard that called, I've heard that called aging pornography. <laughs> it's a substitute for the real thing. Substitute for the real thing. It's not, that has nothing to do with our inner life. Aging is an inner game. It's about our head and our hearts. And so forget this. I mean, hooray for the 92-year-old who can water ski. That's great. I mean, let's celebrate that. Have some fun with it. I don't mean put that down, but, but it really is not the real game for most of us. So what's the real game? The real game is this inner game, and we're going to talk about that some more. All right. So uh, let me stop here a minute. Oh, do this. All right. Um, any questions and answers at this? Or, I've got the answers. <laughs> what am I saying? Whoa, forgot. Uh, are there any questions at this time? I'd like to slow myself down because I can get going too fast. And any, anybody want to ask a question? And, and no questions is fine, by the way. I don't, it's not like fifth grade where the teacher's going to get mad if you don't have a question. <laughs> my, my class is not participating, but it is a way for me to just check in with you. Anybody have one you want to say <clears throat> about anything I read or anything? Going once. Hey, all right, a brave soul. What do you, what do you say? And I'll repeat the question, so don't worry about it uh, if it's too soft. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. The, so the question was, uh, and first of all, let's give that man a book because he asked such a great question. Patricia, give that man a book. <laughs> all right. All right. There you go. That's it. All right. Uh, he got the. He got one of the books. We'll, I'll talk about the books at the, in, at the end here. But um, the uh, uh, my my life has been in the human development business because I got into leadership development at about age thirty. I had, I'm a child of the 60s. I was kind of a lost soul. I joined a cult and stuff. So the interesting, interesting past that you don't really want to know about. But, uh, but anyway, I settled down and got a career. And, and, and by age 30, I got into a training and development of leaders and managers. And I'm still doing that today, believe it or not, but on a part-time basis. So I'm semi-retired. How many of you are semi-retired right now and still, but still working? Let's just do a show of hands. 25% of the people over 65 still work. It's, and it, I thought it was even be higher than that. I think in my field, maybe it's more. So today I'm still doing that. I get to coach virtually, you know, online. And I get to uh, do some training for, I do, I do this. And uh, I, I do some writing and things like that. Does that help? 
All right, thank you for your question. And I'll put, I'll put some personal stuff up here from my life just because that's the one I can tell stories from the best. But uh, it's not meant to be a norm. It's just meant to be, be what, what I do. Yes? Yeah, how do you, so the, the question was, how do, you, how do you reframe cracks and crinkles and pain, right? Yeah, well, there's, there is there's another book here. All right, there goes the second book. All right, great. Um, thank you, Patricia. Um, well, the reframe on, 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 on pain is a big one. And there's a difference between pain and suffering, uh, right? And, and a lot of us make pain worse than it is by resisting it. Uh, and, and, and some people live with a lot of pain and you'd never know it because they somehow muster up the courage to live through it and to not make it a major factor. Other people have to, you know, can't, can't do that all the time. I'm not saying pretend it's not there. I am saying that the additional suffering is the resistance, resistance that come with them. And, and uh, there's a religion, well, I, I, just, I don't know if you'd call Buddhism, Buddhism a religion or not, but Buddhism calls it second arrows. There's the first arrow of the, of the thing that hurt, and then the second arrow is, just, why is this happening to me? Well, the answer to why is this happening to me is, well, why not you? And that's a harsh answer in some ways. That's harsh. But, but in other ways, it's, yeah, what, what makes us exempt? You know? so, but there's a lot to that. I'll give you a great... Uh, let me do a little bit more on suffering. I didn't have this in my plan, but I'll do it um, since it came up. And thank you for bringing it up. Um, um, there's a, I'll just give you the poem. I won't give you the, the long, long story behind it. It's been used in American history in beautiful ways. But there's a Greek, a Greek poem by Aeschylus that goes like this. Even in our sleep, pain which cannot, which can, uh, even in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart. Until, in our despair, uh, and, and against our will, comes wisdom with the awful grace of God. So I don't know if poetry helps you at all there, but it's somehow, because some people say, poem is great and has many gifts. Clarity is not one of them. So, so poems can obscure stuff. But that notion of somehow pain can't forget until I somehow see why, make meaning out We have to make meaning out of it. So. So I'm going to stop the Q&A right now just because this is going to get me way off into a lot of it. But thank you for your great question. Thank you for the fun question back there. And let's, let me move on if that's all right. If that's all right, if, can I do that? Okay, thank, thanks for letting me do that. We are going to do some Q&A at the end, and I'm just watch, making sure we stick with our, our time. But hold your question. Hopefully we'll get to it. All right. Um, let me think. So Patricia will keep me on track. There's Patricia with our... Uh, with our grandson Stoyan, who was adopted from Bulgaria. And Stoyan has had, uh, he's had a tough life. He came in from Bulgaria. He was uh, four years, almost five years old, and he weighed 29 pounds when, he got, when we adopted him. He was a little skinny little guy. And uh, my son and granddaughter, Tammy and Jeff, uh, adopted him. And then he had, he had uh, some autism was starting to show up in his life as he went into about, about age 10. And then he got epilepsy bad. And that scar you're seeing there is a, uh, they, they did a corpus colostomy. They split his brain in half and made his brain reorganize. And there's reason, there, that's a common practice for epilepsy, by the way. But uh, uh, that's the, uh, the picture that I put up there just to show you that in some ways, uh, you know, that's Patricia. That, that's, a, that's a woman with a purpose there. That's Grandma Patricia back there. And she's, you know, one of the great grandmas in life. And it, it gives her a lot of purpose. And now she's a great aunt out here to 20 there's 21 people in her family out here. So a little, a little picture of purpose there. So here's the three peaks of our development, all right? And um, they're pretty easy to see. But remember when you were young and you, and you had physical energy, and you said, wow. And so there, but that, that peaks. So we watch, uh, we watch athletes peak. You know, we watch uh, oh, the Chiefs or the Broncos or something. You know, you see all those. Ads. They, they're done by 30-something. Maybe they go into their 40s if they're get, really lucky. You know what the, the, the age is for uh, uh, young girls who are gymnastics, what, what, what their natural age for peaking is? 14. How would you like to peak in your sport at age 14? Uh, so 
so physical energy is, is one that peaks, but maybe, you know, you can keep it going a long time, and some of you might still be runners in Hawaii for that, and, or at least joggers or walkers or... How many pickleball players? We should see the pickleball players in the room. <laughs> right? There's pickleball players in the room, right? Um, and Kevin right over there. We played just last week. Way to go, Kevin. But Patricia played this morning, actually. All right. But midlife is productive energy time. Productive energy is career and family. Career and family. That's what occupies so much of our time when we're midlifers, right? And so this long, long run of raising kids, or if you didn't do kids, you extend yourself into the community or the or, or your extended family, your, your, but it's all about relationships and it's all about uh, career -y things then. But then you give that up eventually, it peaks. But elderhood is when human energy is at its peak, and this is that story that's not told. This is a story that we, in some cultures, this does go on. Asia, uh, big parts of Asia, India and, and, and China, elders are seen as, as wise beings and as, as those who should, we should pay respect to. We became an economic problem in about the 1870s when the industrial age said, uh-oh, they're starting to pile up in the cities, all these old people, and they're not productive anymore. What do we do about that? That literally was what sociologists turned aging into for many years. And nursing centers came out of it. There's an interesting history about that. One of the books that's on your list, is, it's called The Journey of Aging, I think. If you want to read about the culture of of how different of how we got to where we are today, that's the book. It's kind of scholarly, but it's a great history of how did we end up not understanding that this is what it's about. It was in the 1980s. The 1980s, gerontologists started asking the question, well, what's the meaning of aging? Instead of this is a sociological economic problem, what's the meaning of aging? And by asking that question, they started turning around, and that's why I'm able today to stand up here and talk about it because they were brave enough and smart enough to say, wait a minute now, this doesn't seem to be normal, and this is just happening to, in the Western world where industrialization was happening. So that was, the, that was the case, all right? So with that as by way of background, what are these similar patterns and unique lives that we have? Well, here's the three stages of aging. I've already, t I've already talked about uh, uh, go-go, slow-go, and no-go, but the word in red there is the deal. Aging is about vitality. Vitality. And vitality isn't how many push-ups you can do, right? Vit and uh, vitality can include a lot of naps, all right? I'm, I'm a big napper myself. But do you have a zest for life? It's that inner game thing. And there's my, I, the groups that are part of my ongoing reflection on the data, there's a couple members here of, of a couple of groups, but, uh, well, I'll just, uh, Jim, want to raise your hand there? I, I love seeing Jim and the curmudgeons hanging out at, the, uh, at FICA. Jim is a curmudgeon. <laughs> And I, and I like asking them, I say, what's the qualification for reader curmudgeon? You and John and Robin and Dave, maybe my, those get together at FICA several mornings a week, right? I, I'm going to speak for you here. And, and they have a great time. And they, but it's a, beautiful, it's a beautiful way to age together because they support each other and tell each other stories. They know each other's lives and they care for each other. And I get to pop in and they let me pop in. It's kind of an honorary member. I'm not up there as often as they are, but it's a beautiful thing. And uh, that, that's, that's one of the groups I would call is one of my databases for it. Now, the curmudgeons, they, 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 may, they have a high sense of humor. They say, well, for our group, you have to be kind of grumpy. Uh, you got to have, uh, you got to be critical of others. Uh, you, uh, you have to be uh, not well informed, but have lots of opinions. <laughs> isn't, that the, isn't that the fun little thing to do? So thank you, Jim, for bringing that. <laughs> Uh, so that's an example of ways we can be in groups. I'm in a group with uh, 70 and 80 somethings with one 94 year old guy who's the happiest guy I know. Literally, he's ready to go. He's 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 been in a wheelchair probably the last five years, but uh, not pain free. But he, he he struggles with pain and he's had many hospital incidents and he's he's had two. Uh, he became a, uh, a widower, widower about 10 years ago, but he said, I'm the happiest I've ever been in my life. And he got asked, what do you, how did you become a happy? He said, I know who I am. I've never been closer to God, and I stopped struggling. I'm peaceful. He's ready to go. I think, man, that, there, there, there's a human being. I want to be around him. I always want to be around Phil when I'm back in Columbus. So that's that group. That's a cool group. The 85-year-old woman in that group, she introduced herself the other day. On that call, she said, well, I'm still healthy enough to drive my friends to the doctor. <laughs> you know, so that was her marker for it. And, and Patricia and I interviewed back at a nursing home about 10 years ago, three 90-year-old women. And they talked about being 90. 
And I said, what were the hardest times of, uh, in, in your 90s? All three of them had had their keys taken away by their kids and because they couldn't drive safely anymore. And they all said that was such a blow. But, but I'm glad, they all said, I'm glad they did it because I wasn't safe anymore on the road. But they talked about that as being a marker in their life, right? So that's the way I picked up my, my research on, on what it's all about. So what it's about for these patterns of, of, and uniqueness, we all have to let purpose somehow find us, like, like grandparenting and volunteering, like the picture with Patricia. And I've already talked with you about a little volunteering today uh, a little bit. But volunteering tends to be a big part of this. But also just hanging out with your family, being a great uncle, or being a good neighbor. Do you like your neighbor? Hang out with your neighbor. You know, talk to people. And, you know, what's wrong with that as a calling? You know, it's, it's these beautiful things we can do in the community. Mainly it's things like being kind and, and, being, and, and being friendly, you know. So these are the things that, that you generate from the inside out in spite of the pain. In spite of the pain, if you can muster up the courage to be kind and gentle and friendly to people, uh, who you, and even the ones you wouldn't normally extend to, that tends to be the key to so much of what this is about. So let's see what my picture is here. Uh, this might be a, a bad picture of me, I can't tell. Yeah, that's... <laughs> that, so I put that in there to show you that this little Band-Aid on my head, you're seeing, this guy has a cool... Oh, there's, there's my friend Jeff. Jeff. Jeff has just had his Mohs. How many of you had Mohs surgery? Let's see the Mohs surgery. All right, a lot of Mohs people in here. That's one of the... Uh, <laughs> It's, it's one of the, uh, I think, rituals of getting older. That, uh, how many, I've had, I had about, I think, 17 Mo's now. I, but but I, I was feeling sorry for myself until I walked out of Mo's with this the other day, about three weeks ago, today it was. And a guy said, this is my 60th Mo's. He played, uh, he, was a, he was a caddy and he played a lot of golf without any sun stuff. So, so I, I said, okay, I guess I won't complain any. But... Uh, uh, but, but that picture was there just to remind me to, you to talk about that a little bit. And just one more of these little nicks, the, 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 the dings and, the, and, the, and more than dings, the really severe suffering that comes sometimes with, with aging. But we, hey, move, pick, pick yourself up, move on as best we can. That's how we do it. Um, all right. So there's that picture. Oh, that was, four, that was a 45-stitch day about eight years ago, by the way. And those are the, they put pressure bandages on you. They were, they were, you could, but but they, did, they used to be able to do horizontal cuts of my forehead until my eyebrows started going up. And they said, well, we can't, we can't do that anymore. So they did a vertical cut here. So. <laughs> All right. So um, the quality of your life is determined by, let me go back to that one. This is, a, this is probably a, a, an important one to remember. The quality of your life is determined by, there's probably lots of good answers to that question. Anybody think of an answer to that question? Good by what? Good choices. good choices. Yeah, good decisions. That's a good answer. What's another one? Attitude. Attitude. Good. What's, how, much you enjoy life. how much you enjoy your life, quality of your life, yeah. Good health. Good health. Finances. Strong no. faith. Pardon? Strong faith, strong faith, yeah. Relationships, there's all kinds of wonderful answers to this. My mentor, the same guy that said, um, that said, what's, that uses the phrase second half of life when I was 39, and he, was a, he said, uh, the quality of your life is determined by the quality of your inner dialogue. Are you talking sense to yourself? Are you talking sense to yourself? And so what we really need to do as we age is, we need to change the scorecard from midlife and youth to what's my new, and then am I, can I talk to sense, sense to myself about what, what, my, what my life is, is, is about right now. Good, good thinking leads to good decisions, mostly. There's no guarantees. There's always risks. But good thinking is part of that, okay, I, got the, I have the capacity to think this through and to make meaning out of things that wouldn't normally make meaning if I, if it didn't, if I didn't do it. So here's some strategies for you. I'd say these are the strategies we can use. Hold on, take on, let go, move on, all right? So this is the funny part. There's a paradox in getting older. There's certain things you want to hold on to. So what was it about my, my youth that I was able to carry forward? And I watch a lot of people in their late 60s and early 70s with this one. And their entire strategy and their entire scorecard for are they aging successfully is as many midlife activities as I can carry forward as long as I can, I'm successful. So if I played tennis back then, I'll play tennis as long as I can. If I lifted weights, if I worked hard, if I worked hard, if I bring home a paycheck, if I, and I remember, you know, so, and, and that, those are the career things, but you can do the same thing with health. You can do things with, if I can, 
spend all this time with my kids and not get tired and not, you know, all these other things. You just hold, it, hold yourself to this earlier stage. So hold on. That's a good strategy. The problem with that strategy is eventually it's not going to work. You can't keep doing that because you you're still holding on to the old metric. So what's your plan B? That's the question. What's the plan B? And that's where the inner game kicks in. And instead of playing the outer game of activities and here's what I can do, you start playing the inner game of here's how I learn, here's how I generate kindness. And this is where substitution comes in. I used to play tennis. I'm going to play pickleball, right? I used to go out and drive over to, uh, you know, up into Evergreen every day or every, every tw twice a week to see my friends. And I can't do that. I don't like driving to Evergreen anymore. I'm, I'm going you know, to stay close. To, we're going to Zoom with them once a week, and I'm going to find new buddies close to home, right? And, and so you start substitute. You start doing. So that's, that's what the hold on is about. Take on is what new learning, what new things come into your life, what new friends. There's interesting research on this. If you make friends, the intergenerational friends, the more, the more friends you have that are older than you, younger than you, the happier you are. It's like just research on that. Friends are a big part of it. And, and younger people, are, 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 they're, they're eager to hang around you if you're vital. If you're, if you're grumpy, of course, nobody wants to be around you. <laughs> Let go. Let go is the big one. Let go is hard to do. This is, this is what we have to get better at usually. And there's usually some pain involved. Patricia said to us about, to me about four, four, four plus years ago, let's go to Denver. I said, really? Do, we have, <laughs> do I have to move again? I mean, but she said, no, I think it might be good for us. So she, just, she gave me all kinds of freedom as to how, to, how long to take. And what, but it was, really, it was really time to come out. I was, I was happy to do it. So I said, okay, we'll go. And I just got rid of the apartment that we had there, one bedroom apartment, uh, about three months ago. Because she led, I had this gradual coming out to Parker. So that was my, my let go process of Columbus, Ohio. And then I'll go back to Columbus uh, later on this week to see some family, but I don't stay at our old apartment. It didn't make sense anymore. So you move on. So hold on, take on, let go. What's your combination of these things and how you mix these up is a huge part of the strategy, common sense strategy. And you could literally have a whole session just on those, those strategies and give yourself examples of what have I done. Have I brought new music in or I just, do I still listen to my same old country hits that I love? You want to hold on to some of the old country hits? You might want to bring in some new music. One sign of aging is, by the way, you don't change out your music. You don't, you don't, pay, any, you don't pay attention to new, to new art. Now, this is a picture of me. There's my son, Dave, when he was about, he's a teenager. He's 43 now, he teaches. That's me in the middle when I had hair and fewer scars. This is my cousin, Dick Schuster. He has Parkinson's now. That's my dad. Hey, Paul. Paul died at age 83. He's probably about a, only a year away from his death there. Those are my two cousins and my two more cousins there over there and my brother-in-law. And that's my 50th birthday. I just show you that just to say, you know, that we've all moved on. And Patricia and I just had some good time with two of those cousins. Dick couldn't make it. But that's just a little example of, you know, ah, the memories that are rich. And then how do I keep my relationship with my cousins? How do I say goodbye to my dad? That's one of the big markers of aging, right? When you lose your parents, empty nesting, the kids leave, now here we go, right? So just a little picture of that strategy and, and how it works. Um, let me think here. I'm going to have a little time with some, a little ending with, uh, uh, I've got to make sure I end this on time, but um, I like this little quote. This is a quote by itself. In the end, only three things matter. How much you loved, how gently you lived, and how gracefully you let go of the things not meant for you. So just remember that the things that are not meant for you anymore, they used to be maybe meant for you. Now, can you let go of those gracefully and move on? So I love that little quote. And that's from uh, Jack Cornfield, I think his name is. Yeah, Jack, Jack Cornfield. All right. so, um, so become a smile millionaire, right? This is the inner game in, in, uh, in big time. So this is the... The moment-by-moment moment joy that you're able to generate. I'll give you a little bit of the science here. <clears throat> what we know about is that uh, if you study the quantum physics world, a lot of you have probably been reading quantum physics recently, right? <laughs> <laughs> there, one guy had. Yeah, all right. <laughs> For, former physicist, maybe? or Mathematician, mathematician all right. <laughs> former. Former, all right. Current, current mathematician. All right. So I knew there was one, there was one quantum physicist there. But, but when you read about the nature of at atoms in the universe, what you discover is everything's vibrations. This looks like solid, but it's really just vibrations that are slower than other vibrations. 
and we call it solid. Our senses pick it up, so we call it solid. But if you go down deep enough, it's all vibration. And so just, just expand that out and think about love as a vibration, <laughs> joy as a vibration. And I think our real job here, if I could nub it down to one thing and we only had one hour to talk, it would be how much joy and love are you putting out in the world? That's really it. And just generate as much of that by minute by minute as you possibly can. That's what it's all about. And it comes from the quantum physics world. And so I got to give you this little, <clears throat> this little uh, fun little poem about, <clears throat> about smiling. It's, it's called Smiling is Infectious. Smiling is infectious. You catch it like the flu. Uh, when someone smiled at me today, I started smiling too. I passed around that corner and someone saw my grin. When he smiled, I realized I'd pass it on to him. I thought about that smile. And I realized it's worth a smile like mine could go all the way around the earth. So if you feel a smile, don't let it go undetected. Let's start an epidemic soon. Let's get the world infected. <laughs> so the simple act of smiling can in and of itself, I think, be the biggest single act of the biggest single choice we make to stay on the side of joy and to stay aside on the positive vibrations. And that's why the media is so negative for us. Because if you get cynical, uh, you're in a bad place. There's a real uh, short little difference between, um, small little difference between wisdom and being a grouch. And what it is is half empty, half full. Because the, uh, uh, a wisdom, per what happens when you get older, you see patterns more quickly, or are you aware of that? <coughs> Think of it this way. A young person comes up to you, uh, in maybe some, something at the, uh, some community group that you're involved with. You know the way committees work and sometimes... We, and so somebody comes up with an objection and you've seen this before. You've seen, you've seen it before and you know they really haven't stated the whole truth. They just said what was... And so because you see that pattern, you can see it and you know, you'll see it within seconds. It's, oh, yeah, I've seen this before. I've seen this, this, this thing before. Well, a younger person won't see the pattern because they haven't seen it enough times. So one of the advantages of being older is what they call crystalline intelligence, which is the opportunity of, of seeing, you, see, you pick up patterns. You need three data points to understand what's going on. A younger person needs 15 data points, and a, a, a real young person needs 30 data points and a large theory and an explanation. Right? And they finally figure, that's how education works. But we are pattern smart. Pattern smart with a big heart becomes wisdom because you can say things to people that make sense. Oh, I see what you mean. Pattern smart with negativity turns into cynicism. I've seen this before. Oh, that's never going to work. Oh, people are always like that, right? And so the small little difference between pattern seeking with heart, which is wisdom, pattern, pattern seeking with cynicism turns into a, a, a grouch. And remember what Lily Tomlin said. She said, <clears throat> no matter how cynical you get, it never seems to be enough. <laughs> so thank you for that. Now, it's, it, this has been a rather serious presentation so far, don't you think? Serious? So isn't it time for a humor break? All right, here we go, humor break. <clears throat> this is Bob Hope. Uh, middle age is when you, still, when you still believe that you'll feel, feel better in the morning. <clears throat> Bob Hope. I'm so old, they've canceled my blood type. <clears throat> uh, I, this is Joan Rivers. I've had so much plastic surgery. Uh, when I die, they're going to have a Tupperware party. <laughs> uh, do you ever get up in the morning, look at yourself in the mirror, and think, oh, that can't be accurate? <laughs> uh, if you see me talking to myself, it's because I'm having a staff meeting. <laughs> Uh, I thought getting old would take longer. Most, most people don't think I'm as old as I am until they hear me stand up. <laughs> Rita Rudner, who was here this year. Uh, I don't plan to grow old gracefully. I plan to have facelifts until my ears meet. <laughs> Irma Bombeck. The only reason I would take up jogging at this age is so that I could hear heavy breathing again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 so it turns out that being an adult is mostly just knowing how to Google stuff. Um, 
My mind is like my internet browser. 19 tabs open, three of them are frozen, and I have no idea where the music is coming from. <laughs> oh, that's great. All right, humor break. And I think I have a few more of these. I'm going to make you think a little bit. These are going to be the next ones. All right, if you can, you ever seen these? They're called lexophiles. You can tune a piano, but you can't tune a fish. <laughs> Try it with a broken pencil, it's pointless. All right, I'm gonna give you one, and you're gonna have to think about these. All right, here comes one. No matter how much you push the envelope, it'll still be stationary. <laughs> All right, all right. If you don't pay your exorcist, you'll be repossessed. <laughs> Thank you. Our physicists back there also study strange things. All right. And uh, I'm reading a book about gravity and a gravity, and I just can't put it down. All right, good. All right, all right good. All right. So those, that's our humor break. That was, we, had to, we had to make sure that. But that's that whole notion of be, be a smile millionaire. How do you keep yourself on the lighter side of things as you go through this? People so appreciate it. And I'm going to close now with a couple more thoughts. That's me with uh, my sister Elaine on my right. And Aunt Dorothy, who died at age 95 about five years ago, exactly. On, on Dorothy's 90th birthday, um, we sang a, we, I sang a song to her that you'll know. It's about mindset. And my sister Elaine has Alzheimer's. <clears throat> She's now about nine years into Alzheimer's. She may be memory carrier for her this year. We're not sure. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quite a long, long decline. She was the superintendent of the Catholic school system of Chicago at her peak. <laughs> And uh, she had 300 schools underneath it. There are only two public schools bigger, two public school systems bigger than hers in the whole United States. And uh, so it's been quite, and she was a wonderful older sister. And, and she don't have, you don't have meaningful conversations when you, any, with her anymore, but you do have meaningful connection. The connection is, is still beautiful and, and wonderful. And as long as you can put up with repetition, it's, 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 it's good to be around. On, on this song, for mindset, you'll know it. <clears throat> I'm getting a little dry here, so... But there's a song that you'll know that came out of the, uh, um, well, our parents used to sing it, I think. Uh, but it's a, a beautiful song, and I'll just sing a little bit of it uh, to remind you a little bit of, about the mindset thing. And it reminds me of, my, <clears throat> of, of, of these two folks, because they're, they're, they were both young at heart. My, my older sister's still young at heart. <clears throat> Fairy tales can come true. They can happen to you. If you're young at heart, for it's hard you will find to be narrow of mind. If you're young at heart, you can go to extremes with impossible dreams. You can laugh when your dreams fall apart at the seams. And life is more exciting with each passing day. And love is either in your heart or on its way. And a beautiful song. So, thank you, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, <clears throat> so that's the mindset you want. So you can go to extremes with impossible dreams. They can fall apart, and you can still laugh about it. The end of it is, and here's the best part. You'll have a head start if you are among the very young at heart. You know, so, so we all, don't we all want that head start, you know, being young at heart? So vitality is not how many Botox operations you can have and <laughs> whatever the industry is trying to sell us. You know, that's not, it's about vitality. It's being young at heart, finding the, the little child. And the good news about getting older is every age you've already been, you bring with you. So bring your 10-year-old and bring your 25-year-old and bring all the adventuresome and all the fun and, and then integrate that with the person you are now. And that takes some work, but, you know, there's still parts of you that aren't, particularly well finished yet, but that's all right. <laughs> well, that's like the little line from one of my, one of my good friends who said, uh, you're perfect just the way you are, but you could use a little work. <laughs> <laughs> so isn't that the paradox? It's the paradox. We're all perfect the way we are, but we all need to keep on working. So we're ready for that. Um, let's do a little Q&A here, and then I might do one more th little song at the end. Yes, ma'am. Retraining your brain. The question is, what's my opinion of retraining the brain and how long it takes? I'm not as, I am not don't have much expertise in that area, man. Um, but I know, it's, I know it's possible. And uh, I know that 
uh, the, there's experts who could probably, who, who know that work better than I do and who could probably tell you this you can do, this one's going to be harder. Uh, but I'm, I'm taking on some things now uh, that are, I'm putting significant effort into it to try to retrain my brain to more, more peacefulness. I, I'd call it prayer and meditation, but a long time now. So I wish I had a better answer for you. Thanks for the question. Yes? Can you keep your reading and research? Yeah. Yeah, the question was, uh, are, what's the difference in men and women culturally between uh, uh, aging, aging for men, aging for women? The answer is yes, and it's too big a topic to go into right now. Um, but aging is often harder on women on the outside because of the physical pressure to look younger. You're always supposed to look like a princess with long blonde hair and be kind of... But, but men, men is, is often, and this is very... Uh, uh, it doesn't make, it doesn't hold anymore. But men's used to be about productivity, and uh, still being able to you know do do that. But now it's all cross gender, and, and it's, but but yes, there are differences, and some people talk about the differences in female and male brain. That's real. Yeah. Diane, I would love to see that slide. The three things that because mm -hmm. I can only remember two. You only remember two. All right. <laughs> all right. Good. All right. Sure. Sure. Happy. happy I think it was pretty important. Yeah. Yeah. This one. One right. that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it helped. I'd forgotten the second one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Jack Cornfield. Yeah, thanks. Well, any, any other questions before we wrap this up? Yes, go ahead. Yes, thank you for the comment. Yeah. Well, one of the ways of, for purpose, yeah, let me repeat the, let me repeat the question. I didn't mention all the people who donate their time and volunteer. I mentioned a teeny bit about volunteering. But one of the ways we find purpose as we age is certainly through the volunteering mechanism because we give away our gifts. Uh, if you answer your call, you do three things. I might as well mention a few things in the back. There's a, the, 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 the takeaway. If you want a little thing on calling and your purpose, that's what the little card is about. We've given away some of the books. The books are not for everybody, but it's called Life Review. When you do Life Review in your life, uh, it's because you want to go back over your memories and you want to either pass it on in a memoir form or some of us have some forgiveness to do. We have to go f forgive others and, we, and we'd like to uh, be forgiven by others. They'll have those final conversations before. So there's lots of, lots of work that goes into the healing work that can go into life review. And that's what the book is about. And then you already got the book list. So that, that's what's in the back and Patricia's kind of monitor. And I didn't bring enough for everybody. So sorry about that. Yes. Well, uh, the, that Grace of Aging book tends to be more Buddhist, but, a, uh, but it was a woman that was Catholic that studied, that got her PhD in psychology and then studied Buddhism as a type of psychology. So that's what the Grace of Aging, the book is about. And the question was about that particular book that's on there. And I tried to notate that, didn't I? You know, there's little notations by everything, yeah. And so if the Eastern... If the Eastern uh, spirituality is not for you, that's, that's a book you probably wouldn't find as helpful. I just can find West and East both helpful. She uses St. Bonaventure and some Christian things in there too, but not as much as the Eastern framework. Yes? Yeah, yeah, great comment. Her comment was more about um, the, uh, the attitude that one of her friends or neighbors had about, I want to learn something every year. And that's a good way to go about it. We know that when you're older and you learn a new skill or you master some new sets of information and knowledge, it's great for your self-esteem and your curiosity stays high. So keep your learning about new things up. I picked up a guitar at age 53 because of my wife. She bought me one and said, here, either play this or stop singing. So I said, okay. So, 
So here's my final gift to y'all, all right? It's a, it's a song, it's a song that uh, I put to someone when I turned 70. This guy said, uh, a friend of mine said, why don't you write a song about beans? So I said, okay, I will. This is called Old Age Anthem. My spirit soars, my thoughts go deep. I feel so alive, I like my sleep. So I take my naps, wear old man caps. My spine compresses, my house no messes. Skin wrinkles, it's an older me. Knees creak, it's a slower me. Mind pondered, it's a wiser me. Heart wide open. Heart wide open, it's a better me. I watch less news, visit more church pews, like to volunteer, don't want much beer. My kids help more, I avoid all letters, green tea I pour, low cholesterol matters. I pray and meditate all the time. Stronger spectacles I so need. I budget careful, watch my nickels and dimes. I'm rethinking my lifelong creed. It ain't too bad, this getting old. It could be worse, that's what I'm told. My spirit soars, my thoughts go deep. I feel alive, I like my sleep, skin wrinkles, it's an older me, knees creak, it's a slower me, mind ponders, it's a wider me, heart wide open, heart wide open, heart wide open, it's a better me. <laughs> we are adjourned. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Really enjoyed being here. <laughs>